Hi, and welcome to the Behavioral Health News Spotlight on Excellence series, where we feature exceptional leaders and innovative healthcare solutions that are raising the standards of care in the behavioral health community. My name is David Minot, and I am the Executive Director of Mental Health News Education, the nonprofit organization that publishes behavioral health news and autism spectrum news. Our mission is devoted to improving lives and the delivery of care for people living with mental illness, substance use disorder, and autism, while also supporting their families and the professional communities that serve them by providing a trusted source of science-based education, information, advocacy, and quality resources in the community. Today, we are speaking with Joseph Wilson, an experienced certified addiction recovery coach and peer specialist who has worked with services for the underserved for the past four years. Joseph is a vital member of the SUS outreach team at the Wellness Works Harlem and Harlem Satellite Program. Joseph is also incredibly proactive in several community initiatives and has forged positive relationships with many community-based partners. He began his career at SUS with the intensive mobile treatment team and transitioned to clinic services in 2018. Prior to joining services for the underserved, Joseph worked for two years on both a part-time and a voluntary basis, lending his skills to group facilitation and patient advocacy within the New York City hospital system. Joseph, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me today, Dave. So, how about we get started by having you tell us a bit about the program that you're currently working for? Okay, uh, first off, um, I work with uh, services for the underserved CTI Harlem Wellness Works Clinic. Um, we're a community and health-based organization who provide uh, outreach and in-clinic services for individuals with substance abuse and mental health, uh, both called current disorders. Wonderful. Um, uh, do, do, would you want to provide an overview of the CCBHC? Sure. Um, so here, um, initially, we started off with services that were just geared towards uh, substance abuse. Um, but now recently, we've integrated uh, an array of services that entails uh, mental health providers, um, telehealth, medicine, uh, housing, vocational, peer support, as well as community outreach treatment services. So um, what about the hospital where you're working? And uh, can you give an overview of that and how it connects back to the clinic? Oh, sure, great. Um, I'm glad you asked that. Um, it's actually something I was working on prior to this interview. Um, uh, we collaborate with several um, city hospitals and community-based organizations to um, offer a collaborative service to transition individuals to the next level of care when they're either in crisis um, needing detox or at the stage of change where they are ready to enter inpatient rehab service for inpatient treatment. So we provide those transitions of care and then we then link the patient once they're returning to the community back to our outpatient clinic here in TCHB services uh, at the Wellness Works Clinic. It's very important work you're doing. Uh, so I think it would help to give a picture of what a day of engagement looks like for you. Um, can you walk us through the referral to engagement and then connection back to clinics? Sure. Um, so we, um, we would receive an email or a call um, where we have created a referral process um, where one of the community-based providers or city-based hospitals would give us a uh, email or call requesting uh, support with an individual who has consented to receiving uh, substance abuse services or substance abuse and or mental health services. Um, at that point, uh, we would then uh, check the demographics uh, and then find the means of contacting the individual. Uh, we call them participants. 
try to shy away from calling them clients or consumers. So sure. they are sensitive because we deliver a patient centered uh, approach and care. So, you know, they are active participants in their treatment plan. So what we do, uh, we have an engagement. And at that point, we assess their needs and um, their treatment options. And then we would make a referral to a rehab or detox or outpatient clinic or directly to our clinic. Um, at that point, uh, after the engagement, uh, we would coordinate transportation with the agency that they're accepted to. And then after we get all the consents done, we would then have them, uh, we would encourage them once they're ready for discharge or when they're speaking with a discharge planner to then reach back out to us for that linkage of care so they won't fall between the cracks from completion of treatment back to the community. So um, that's how it comes back full circle to the clinic. Um, gotcha. Um, and do you happen to have uh, like a particular success story in mind um, uh, from, you know, from your work? Oh, yes. Uh, I can provide you several. But, uh, <laughs> Is one where um, it's direct um, directed to the clinic and the services that we provide here, um, and how a person's needs um, isn't just based on one factor. Um, it's a holistic approach. Um, there's several factors, and it may be one thing that they may have needs with, but through engagement and building rapport, and you know, using skills like motivational interviewing. Um, and that intentional peer support, we build a rapport um, and we have the participant feeling comfortable enough to then start really telling us about some of those real underlying needs that they may have. And it may stem just from one simple thing. And the, uh, the example I have, we had a participant who um, was coming to the clinic for services, um, engaging in mental health services as well, substance abuse counseling, but then he started to engage with the vocational specialist. Um, he ran into a barrier of not having a state ID. He had a city ID, but not a state ID um, and was motivated to work. And initially he was frustrated uh, because of that barrier, um, but through the intentional peer support and you know, just making him feel comfortable and staying consistent, uh, we were able to then after COVID, have him come into the clinic and we started working on some ways to overcome those barriers. And uh, I assisted him with obtaining uh, an application in the waiver form for his green card, which he lost in the transition of moving from place to place, shelter to shelter. Um, we filled out the application, got sent back twice, staying consistent. Um, we got a call back. He called me about two weeks ago and told me that he was approved, the fee waiver for $450 was waived and the application was approved. Um, now he's just going for his biometrics to do his fingerprinting. And then now he would then have his green card, which will allow him to go to DMV and get a state ID, right? So through assisting him with that, now he's able to then get that ID to seek employment again. Now he can seek those vocational services that we provide. Um, and through that, we've gotten him to actually open up more. He's uh, actively engaged in his treatment. Um, he's coming to the clinic, uh, engaging, doing sessions regularly. Um, just through, and he stayed he stay, he stay motivated. Uh, you know, even when, he, you know, the application got sent back, you know, he stayed consistent with us because he knew he had that support. You know, it's yeah. so important. So important. And this is a, an individual who doesn't have any immediate family in New York. Sure. So, yeah. And without you, uh, he wouldn't be where he is now. You know, and that must be know, a good feeling. Oh, oh uh, of course. I mean, it's very satisfying. But, you know, I do this from the heart, you know, to give back to the community. You know, you yeah. Know, provide services. Um, you know, it's about empowering each one, teach one. Yeah. You know, yeah. If I, if I can help you overcome a barrier. Um, and then in the process of doing that, you know, teach you something, motivate you towards something or another goal or encourage you to work on some things, you know, it's a win-win. 
Um, you mentioned COVID. Just curious, um, how did COVID impact what you do? Oh, well, as you know, we all know it impacted the world, let alone New York City, let alone our organization. Uh, but through, you know, strong leadership here at Wellness Work, uh, we were able to come up with a plan to still deliver services via telehealth. Um, and that was an amazing thing because it uh, afforded us the opportunity to actually be a little more consistent than we might have been when seeing the patients, the participants here um, on a regular basis, you know, as they might have gotten accustomed to. So now, you know, we're calling them, we're doing safety checks, we're doing wellness checks, you know, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, telehealth was really fantastic. And I guess you probably still are using it. Of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, it, we combined it too, you know, sometimes the telehealth allows us the ability to be able to assess someone that may need in-person services by doing a video call, doing a telehealth, you know, via Zoom or Teams, and we can then put eyes on a participant who may have not, you know, seen someone in a minute. So that allows us to, you know, do a real thorough wellness check, you know, via telehealth services. Yeah. Um, you know. So, um, I'd like to hear some of the highlights and challenges of the work that you do. Um, I know you you uh, support uh, get support from the hospital staff, but uh, there may be some challenges and how you uh, and how how do you work around those challenges? Well, um, you can start with know, the highlights. How about how about the highlights first? <laughs> right. Um, some a lot of highlights is being able to. Uh, see a participant um, at a pre-contemplative stage or in crisis mode, then seeing that participant uh, excited and motivated after engagement in a few days of support, if it's a few days, then to see them return to the clinic. Um, it's, it's just so rewarding, um, self-rewarding. Um, it's, just, it's just a validation of the work we do and the importance mm -hmm. of work that we do um, yeah saving lives of course um yeah. if you know if you will another example just today um from the community outreach a uh, gentleman came to the clinic today um he reached out to us just from our community outreach and um, flies with our connection with mta and doing community outreach he was able to contact us looking into services and we assessed his needs, found out that detox would be, you know, a good fit for him at that particular time. Uh, he was ambivalent, um, but, you know, we engaged, stayed consistent. The next day he went to treatment. Um, I got a call three days later with a discharge plan uh, and Back again to your first question, it came full circle because they called us and wanted to know the address and when can he have an appointment. Um, he showed up today for an appointment and for some more, you know, engagement around some of his needs. And we were able then to share some community-based resources that may then help his uh, housing needs, his employment needs. And I mean, he was just so grateful and humble to have the support and have someone that he can relate to um, in this peer work. That's the, another beauty and rewarding thing about this work that we do. Um, when you do this peer work, you're able to um, share some stories of strength and resiliency to motivate, uh, to use that to elicit change. Yeah, I would imagine that, I would imagine I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. I would imagine that you may have even, you know, formed some friendships over uh, and bonds with people and their experiences over time. Oh, well, you know, these these reports and these therapeutic alliances, you know, they never stop because recovery right. never Life doesn't yeah. stop. So, uh, you know, it's an ongoing process, you know. You may need a lot of support today, a little bit tomorrow, but as long as the support is there, you know, 
that's what keeps the bridge gap. Yeah. Um, so uh, what about some challenges that you've had to face? Well, some challenges that we may face, um, this may be in, um, challenges or some time with insurances uh, or restrictions that they may have. Um, just um, draw back from the patient themselves, um, you know, and, and that's, that, that's normal, but, you know, we overcome those barriers and challenges with consistency, um, you know, through positive reinforcement, validations, um, and, you know, having a, someone that's providing non-judgmental support uh, and patient-centered, it, it sometimes makes the difference between those barriers and those challenges um, because they feel that they have somebody to walk with through them, through those challenges. Mm -hmm. even, even the challenges that we may face, sometimes you find a participant might be saying, okay, it's all right, we're going to get through it, Mr. Wilson, it's all right. And, you know, so that it's a two-way street. Yeah. Uh, um, so if you had a wish list, uh, what do you think could be added to this program to make it better? Some more funds is one. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> more staff. I'm sorry, you cut out more what? Staffing. Yep, um, staffing. And, and what I mean by that is um, just more individuals that, who are passionate about this work, um, who decide to go into this field um, for whatever reason, but for the right reasons and are willing to really make a difference in someone's lives. Uh, that, that's, that's one of my biggest wishes. This is why I continue to do this work every day. Uh, I give 110% every day, um, you know, to, to fill those voids, at least try to. Sure. Yeah, uh, I really admire the work you do. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're saving lives and, uh, um, you know, with your own experience, your own life experiences, you're able to relate to these people. And I'm sure uh, versus just hearing from doctors and, uh, and, and other staff, uh, it really is a lot more meaningful uh, in some instances coming directly from you. Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, sometimes uh, yeah. you find a patient that may be um, so resistant to treatment or to progress or to change, um, it may not be into that point that they do have peer engagement that you see some change or motivation mm -hmm. to work. So that's very true. Well, you know, it's been, it's wonderful to learn about what you're doing, uh, and I really commend you for, for the wonderful work you're doing at Services for the Underserved. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. I'm humbled. Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Um, and uh, for those watching, for more information about Services for the Underserved, please visit sus.org. And stay tuned for our next installment of Behavioral Health News Spotlight on Excellence series. Mm -hmm.